Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the World Academy of Art and Sciences International Conference and Future Education's panel discussion on a very important topic, climate education for human security. My name is Gehkusha. I am a junior fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and the founder president of Global Social Innovation Enterprise Green Hope Foundation. And I'm truly delighted to be your moderator for this session. Now, this topic is very relevant in today's environment because with devastating climate change induced weather events that are causing havoc across the world, especially in the communities that are seen as most vulnerable, there is finally an awakening in particular at the global stage that climate change can no longer be trivialized. And in fact, it needs to be at the forefront of any and all discussions related to human progress and human security. And the basis of all such dialogue has to be evidence-based, embedded in science and not on conjecture and political overtures. And as someone who has been working uh, on the front lines of climate change mitigation for over a decade, I can vouch based on my lived experiences that education appropriately conceived can be such a powerful tool, probably the most powerful tool in enabling effective adaptation and mitigation of climate change. And that leads to effective strengthening of human security. However, one must delve deeper and address several other facets related to this complex issue of critical importance is protecting and deploying education infrastructure, strengthening social and material resources on which education depends, as this will lead to vulnerability reduction and build resilience. And secondly, where infrastructure exists, we need to improve general education that's measured in terms of literacy, of school attendance, and overall academic attainment. And this can enhance adaptive capacity. And thirdly, possibly where we are sorely lacking is in accelerating research-based adaptation learning support that can energize social and policy change by maximizing learning before and during adaptive decision making. So overarching and transformational change is required in embracing climate education into the mainstream that embraces all models of pedagogy so that human societies seek to balance the old social mechanisms that ensure stability with new ones that facilitate change. And however, as I witnessed often at the grassroots level, our capacity to systematically support the learning that undergirds adaptation may be the limiting factor. Some of the key insights that we therefore need to acknowledge and work on are the value of education for climate change adaptation policy that has been limited by vague definitions and poor cross-field communication, strengthening the three distinct but overlapping pathways, each offering concrete policy options, education infrastructure, general education, and adaptation learning support. And finally, the greatest value of climate education lies in the transformative potential of adaptation learning support, circular, pedagogical, and technological, with resources that prepare people for the complex adaptive decision-making and really help them to solidify learning during that work. So it is with this background thought that I would like to take forward today's discussion and invite our speakers to share their cross-sectoral knowledge and experience on the scene that has assumed such tremendous significance today. So without any further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to take the floor, Kareem Ahab Salah, member COP27 Youth Task Force and Future Sustainability Leader. Kareem, the floor is yours. Yeah, hi everyone. Can you hear me uh, good? We can hear you. Okay, awesome. I'm pretty happy to be here with you today. Um, it's such a dear topic to me that I've worked on for a couple of years now. And um, I truly believe that when we talk about human security, 
currently the greatest threat to human security is climate change. And that's very obvious, should be very obvious to all of us with the numbers that we have. Because currently, according to the UN, 800 million people around the world, currently, not in the future, are uh, uh, um, vulnerable to the climate change impacts, such as droughts, floods, heat waves, extreme weather events, and sea level rise. Okay, so how does this relate to human security? It's pretty obvious such events will cause economic crises, climate refugees, or even wars for our basic needs. And that's because we're going to have lack of resources in the future, and actually even now, because of the climate change. So that's why we are in a dire need for accessibility of climate education for everyone. But naturally, we cannot solve the climate problem that is possessing a threat to human security without first having proper diagnosis. That's what I would like to say. Because if you can imagine a sick person, he will never be able to treat his sickness without being aware of it in the first place. And he will not be able to treat it only with awareness. He needs proper diagnosis. So that's where education comes in play. We need people to be not only aware that, okay, we are having a problem. We have uh, climate change is going to affect all of us. If you don't know what to do exactly, you will not solve the problem. You need to be aware of the, uh, all the discussions that's going on, all the negotiations that's going on. You need each and everyone in this world need to be aware how climate change is going to affect the individuals, how it's going to affect the indigenous communities, how it's going to affect uh, the women and children and future generations. They need to be educated about adaptation, mitigation, climate financing. There is a lot of climate education going on. It's not just simple terms. So I believe that we, we're in a dire need for climate education for everyone. So with this, I would be extremely happy all the attendees only got one takeaway from uh, my talk and they can search about it more and they can learn about it more. And that term is action for climate empowerment. And uh, it's abbreviated as ACE. That's a very important term that have been acknowledged by the UN and UNFCCC, uh, Article 6 of the convention in 1992 and Article 12 of the Paris Agreement. The main overarching goal of ACE is to empower all members of society to engage in climate action. So the main goal, again, we need all stakeholders. We need private sector, we need public sector, we need governments, we need individuals, we need NGOs, we need everyone. So it's, definite, it's, it's basically action for climate empowerment. I think it's self-explanatory, um, but also it has six main pillars, okay? Um, it's still a general, a general term, so we need to define it more to know what exactly is action for climate empowerment, how can we engage in it, and how it can be the solution to have more uh, uh, people educated about climate. The first pillar is climate education. We got public awareness, training, public participation, and public access to information and international cooperation on these issues. So if you're gonna focus about the six main pillars, they're all revolved around education and climate education. So how did the UN inc incorporate ACE so that the government and private sector, sector are reliable? Because we have heard many times in the past that people um, say a lot of good stuff and they give a lot of uh, uh, promising, uh, 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 act, uh, promising uh, promises, I would say, and we don't incorporate them in our agendas or in our action plan. So that's why we got a specific term for it. That's why we got articles for it. That's, wh that's how we got uh, 196 uh, countries in the last COP, COP27, to attend the thematic day only for ACE, for Action for Climate Empowerment. So the, the, the activities that UN does in, in, in Action for Climate Empowerment file is ACE negotiations, and that's mainly to advance policies, to make an exact uh, KPIs that countries uh, uh, can be held uh, uh, reliable to, and that they should be delivering for each year for example, in the last COP, we got a historic uh, ACE uh, uh, policy that makes a four-year plan for the next four years for all countries that they should deliver on. I, I advise you to go search on it because I will not have much time to, to go into details about it, but I, I really think you should uh, visit it. Also, we got uh, 
national ACE focal points. So in each country, in your country, you can search it. You got an ACE focal point. You can reach out to him and you can discuss how can you as an individual, as an organization, as a government, incorporate ACE in your country, in your community, in your school, in your university, whatever. And also we got ACE Dialogue and ACE Hub. When I talk about, again, when I want to tell you that I want each and every one of you to have a main key away, take away from this, and is how can you contribute to ACE? I will tell you first my story and how I contributed to ACE quickly, and then a quick uh, advice, I would say, on how you can implement ACE in your daily life and in your community. For myself, I worked on a national initiative in Egypt uh, pre-COP27, and it was mainly focused around educating the youth and uh, supporting the young entrepreneurs when it comes to climate change. I also participated in workshops in my country in the rural areas where they rarely hear about climate change. I was also part of the COP27 Youth Task Force, COP27 Youth Task Force, where I used my voice to, to, to advocate for climate and raise awareness. And I tried to use uh, a good uh, use of my social media in order to uh, spread awareness about it. So my, my quick advice for you would be part, how to participate in ACE as an individual. It would be first get educated about the topic because you cannot educate more people or raise awareness if you are not um, uh, if you are not educated enough about the topic, you can uh, volunteer, you can spread the world, use your social media and talk about it with your community, with your friends. Finally, the expected cycle of climate education or any education in general, it will start in the first steps with awareness, workshops and trainings. That's the basic level. Then we might expect it to have master's research topics and PhDs, and then it's gonna start to be in bachelor's and the schools. But my message here, is that we shouldn't wait for this whole cycle for the climate change studies and education to be incorporated in schools and bachelors. We need to start all of them simultaneously because apparently we don't have much time. And finally, my final quote that I like to end with is uh, from Mother Teresa. I cannot change the world alone, but I can cast a stone across the waters that can create many rebels. And I hope that me and all of the attendees can also create many rebels. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Karim, for sharing not only about how not knowing what climate change is, it makes it quite literally impossible to take climate action. And that actually reminded me of something that we saw, what my team and I saw when we first started our climate resiliency education program at our Green Hope Foundation School, where the students were shocked to learn that some of the impacts that they had just chalked up to being bad luck were actually impacts of climate disasters, which then led them to the understanding Understanding that they could actually take actions to address the climate change impacts. So thank you very much for sharing how important climate education is to take climate action. I shall now invite our next speaker, Arti Sharma, coordinator of climate science. Arti, you have the floor. Thank you, Kekasa. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope I'm audible. So First of all, I would like to thank WAS for conducting this conference. It is my honor to be a part of the panel today with such esteemed speakers. For my presentation, initially, I would like to address the interdependency of human security and climate education. As we all know that human security is the precedence of individual security over territorial security. And the provision of fundamental rights to every human is what human security is all about. But we know that the fundamental rights are not only confined to food, shelter, and clothing, and more, but include education, health, employment, and living standards as well. And our living standards today are hugely dependent on the changing climate around the globe, and the effects of climate change can also be felt individually. When we talk about the spreading of climate education around the world, there are two significant challenges which I would like to bring attention to in today's conference. First is the need to build physical, digital, and human infrastructure fast enough. We are currently at a place where the importance of climate education is known to a small sector of the world. Now, this issue is essential, but more important is that relevant and accurate information is spread to the individuals, especially the youth. The inclusion of climate change as a part of curriculum will require the recruitment of newly trained teachers for universal primary and secondary education. And considering the transformation in education post-pandemic situations, the world requires digitally equipped schools. 
Along with this, we have some specific education standards which vary amongst the countries and become a barrier to access for new entrants who are developing the mass content. Now, the second big challenge is the inclusion of youth in designing the curriculum for climate education. As a part of the Youth Declaration on Transforming Education 2022, one of the essential demands of the youth was their inclusion in the development of curriculum for the schools and ensuring that the provision of education related to human rights, climate change, psychology, technical and vocational training, which would be free from all the biases. Now, they demanded the eradication of legal, financial and systematic barriers that hinder providing the primary education worldwide. So the opinions of youth today are of primary importance as they are the consumers. And it is their right to be able to just decide what to learn and which manner they want to consume the information. So before moving on to suggestions and solutions, I would like to introduce climate science briefly. So climate science is a UK based NGO that aims to spread the education in simple and easy to understand ways. So the suggestions that I will discuss here will basically be related to the steps and the actions that we as an organization have taken and the results that we have achieved in spreading climate education across the globe. Regarding the infrastructure building, Climate Science has built an advanced digital learning platform for students worldwide and offers courses in varied languages. Not only the technology, but the volunteers of CS spread across 40 plus countries are working at ground level to conduct seminars and educational conferences to provide climate change education to schools and colleges. We also offer series of books covering all the major topics of climate change and its effect. And not only this, but we have a team of dedicated teacher training courses which are aligned with the UK and USA's NGSS curriculum. Now, this focuses on dealing with different education standards based on the territory. We as an organization always believe that understanding climate change should not be very complicated. It should be very easy. And we always work on our courses and study materials continuously to keep them upgraded and relevant to the changes which are happening around us. We do this by turning scientific papers into accessible and illustrated digital content that is easy to understand. Since its inception in 2019, we have developed the world's most advanced climate education platform and cultivated learning communities built on values of critical thinking, kindness, and radical optimism. What we believe is that students should leave school with skills, positive mindsets, and hope rooted in confidence in what they want from there and their community's futures. As such, we are happy to work with governments, consultancies, UN, and university initiatives to transform education, to support innovation, positive social impact, and effective climate action. We are coming to the second significant challenge, which is the youth inclusion. So when we talk about our community, the content at CS includes courses which are suitable for all the age groups. The content is well-researched, designed, and constantly reviewed to make it fit for people to understand the complex and challenging topics. One of the biggest strengths of our community is the volunteers. Our team consists of students of varying age groups who provide their important feedback, knowledge, and experience to make our content better and more engaging. This is how the content keeps improving, but it is the youth who is designing for the youth itself. Our curriculum takes care of the requirement of students based on the region and provides translated information to make it more accessible worldwide. The techniques which proved useful to us were the use of engaging and simple ways of presenting the complex information such as that of climate change. There are scientific facts, data and figures, technical concepts, which often need to be more appealing to the youth today. So we also have a short span when learning new concepts. So the CS courses with interesting images, captivating Instagram and YouTube videos, and exciting presentation have always made the complex topics such as climate economics, climate projections, and clean energy more accessible and exciting for the youth. Apart from the courses, the CS Olympiad is an annual event which attracts students from all over the world to come forward to compete and find solutions to climate change. The Olympiad has proved to be an exemplary event where more than 50,000 plus students from 190 plus countries participate. Now, it eventually leads to a chain effect of educating and discussing climate change matters with people around us. So the aim of any education should be to initiate the discussion amongst the youth. In the description of the conference, I read the statement which said education empowers. Education aims to empower everyone with the knowledge, skills, understanding, and attitudes which are needed for human security and accomplishment. Now, the transformation should aim at empowering the youth with all the required knowledge that they require along with primary schooling. 
The content of any curriculum should be constantly researched and reviewed, not only by professionals, but by the youth as well. Students' feedback is essential in making the curriculum more engaging and better. A future education aims to enable the youth to change the society as an individual, a community, an industry, or even as a government. As a closing remark, I would like to highlight that conventional and digital education methods are complementary and we need to emphasize equally on both the platforms when discussing climate education. Thank you everyone for your time and patient listening. Thank you, Aarti. Uh, what particularly stood out to me was when you spoke about teacher training and for youth about youth creating curriculum for young people, and particularly about when you mentioned compassion in climate education, and that's something that we see uh, in a, my team and I worked wherever uh, around the world, and particularly in children and young people who are so passionate about wanting to create a better world, that compassion is something that's inherent in them. And actually incorporating that into climate education is something that is really important, which is why young people curating content for other young people is really, really important. So in that way, climate education really is an essential for innovation for a sustainable future. So thank you once again. I shall now give the floor to Philip Novakovic, Cambridge University Land Economy, JP Morgan Incoming Analyst, Mazdar, and IRENA Sustainability Leader. Philip, you have the floor. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you all for being at this conference. We really hope to have an impactful discussion here and bring value to those listening. Well, I would like to start off by really saying, in terms of my personal experience, first of all, um, in terms of climate change advocacy and how this journey can really project and actually make a wider impact on the world. So personally, I have really experienced a transition in terms of my, whole, my own mindset from a mere method of absorbing information to a more impactful and creative action-oriented approach of utilizing this education and actually bringing forward much needed action in the world. And this change of mindset really came with benefits not only to me as an agent in helping me develop numerous skills, but also the community, communities my work uh, was affecting itself. And why is this really important? Well, having this kind of approach is really crucial because people's determination to create constructive and local action, which ultimately translates into something global, really remains to be, even to this day, a strong driver of bettering human security and improving communities locally. As we all know that endogenous action can be so much more valuable than simply exogenous intervention as other international organizations have been trying for years. So for example, one part of human security that I consider to be often overlooked are the conditions in which students spend time in whilst they're in education. This is because development agencies often monitor only educational programs by looking at the basic metrics of outcomes in the short term and only in terms of one to two years educational cycle. So overlooking these conditions in which education is being delivered really actually even implements um, many risks to the educational outcomes and reduces the outcomes in, in knowledge attainment, numeracy and literacy skills, which is compounded on a macro level can bring in much, much increases in inequality but also human security in many aspects. So in terms of my story itself, this is what really led me to start off my first nonprofit organization, age six, 17, um, which is called Greener Schools and operates in 15 countries across three continents. It has the aim of improving environmental and social sustainability in schools and universities. And through a network of 50 volunteers, we're able to create tangible impact by advocating for better conditions in which education is being develop, developed, both in the developed and developing world. We need education that is basically centered around the students and the natural environments, and that empowers the students to actively engage with their environments, rather than exogenously bringing knowledge to them, which might not be fully diffused or even recognized. 
So with Cognizance that we had more than 5,000 students in 30 schools affected, we also made sure to go the extra mile to modify the content of education. So we have different students' curriculums, which are more aligned with education on climate change and also provide an incapacitating approach to develop these important entrepreneurial skills for the student. That's why we wanted to ensure long-term viability and really make these schools self-sufficient in bringing in the future leaders of both climate action, but also of climate education. So by making them independent through capacity building and skill improvement, we're able to ensure that. So another obstacle that we found whilst we're all doing this is that many young people, even to this day, the more educated they were about human security, about global issues, the more pessimistic they were in terms of how they can actually contribute to the overall impact and action sphere. One approach that fellow activists and my friends found really useful is to really base our actions on rational hope and inspiration, not despair or fear. Fear is not going to motivate us in the long term. Sustained change that we all need to move the needle on climate change. And in terms of another aspect that I've been involved with is climate finance and bringing in the role of accelerators and entrepreneurship to be the source for both maintaining, improving, and driving human security through innovation. And human security combined with the education actually provides a great nexus for an ecosystem where we need to galvanize innovation in. But simply said, by itself, we need innovation both in the educational sector, but also we need innovative outcomes coming out of the educational investment. And this is because education itself can be the power of transforming lives and societies. It's a very useful tool. And advocate climate education is the basic building block for human development. And it will allow us to adapt to the conditions of our changing planet. But if we do not enfranchise people themselves to utilize this education in a meaningful way, we will not see the benefits of this new knowledge on local communities and especially on vulnerable people. So we need this paradigm shift in both education, but also entrepreneurship ecosystems, and especially in the developing world. And for that, obviously, there's so many other needs and requirements. We need more funding, both by increasing the existing streams accessible to students, to entrepreneurs, to people who have ideas, but also building new streams, new organizations, new types of bodies, which will serve to both connect, but also collaborate between the two. And we need to make new opportunities from the governmental sector, but also from the private sector. One organization that's been exceptionally well in the Middle East is Mazdar, who has premium initiatives, Youth for Sustainability, trying to drive sustainability, through skill building, through innovation accelerators. And on the other tangent, we also need better conditions. We need mentorship schemes for our entrepreneurs, for students, and we need accelerators. So once they're done with their education, once they're done with their skill building, they have adequate conditions in which they can bring their ideas forward and really improve the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Lastly, trust and institutional backgrounds are essential. They're essential because they can really galvanize collaboration, not only create competition. This is because competition itself will not bring us the results we need. We need co collaboration because collaborating is the only way we can address climate change and the only way we can bring forward human security improvements. One another, and just another aspect I'd like to touch upon is the role of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. This is an area that is often overlooked in development studies and development initiatives. Cognitive um, skills are obviously essential for 
for really improving the educational outcomes. But non-cognitive skills, such as determination, motivation, drive, such as emotional intelligence, these are all skills which are built on a long-term effect, long-term time scale, but they need to be absolutely highlighted in every single educational outcome analysis. This is because it's really essential to have empathy, to have these non-cognitive skills for us to actually be able to tackle human security. So with that, I would like to close and I would really like to really accentuate and highlight the importance of innovation, of having the state support innovation and building this ecosystem around innovation so we can have a better human security. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philip. Absolutely. We do need education for sustainable development and climate education at every level to facilitate innovation. And to ensure that, we need to empower that young people to take action through this education because, as we all know, enough talking has been done. So now we do need that meaningful localized climate action because only then can we use that to facilitate climate innovation and that paradigm shift that you spoke about for climate justice and human security. Uh, thank you once again. Our next speaker is Selma Bikbik, social and climate youth activist, human rights CP, uh, Yango, UNEP MGCY member, founder Together for Blue and Green, and co-founder Mina Youth Network. Selma, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And for my last name, I know it's a bit confusing, but it's Bishbish. <laughs> so. I'm not mad, no worries. <laughs> all right. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for the invitation for bringing this up. Um, indeed, it is one of the very important topics that we need to address, especially as youth. And we do know that having an educational system that involves this kind of knowledge where we can share with, with youth about what is it exa exactly climate change, um, at least simplify it. Because for example, I do live in a, in a community where bringing up the climate change um, topic to the floor is like oh that's that needs a background so that's the usually that's the uh, i would say the um, the comments that i get when i talk about such uh, issues and challenges so the first part that we need to focus on is simplifying that and this can happen actually through education system at least like the first step so basically uh, i would love to kick this off by uh, talking about our my first experience that when i i realized that th it's high time for me to link this link education with climate change so that we can educate people about it simplify it to be more precise and and then implement do things after because again we're sick of drafting and talking all time you know um so basically it started in youth for climate summit in milan where i have been um the uh, female delegate that represented Algeria. And uh, we have been leading, uh, I was among the lead that the co-facilitators of one of the working groups during the summit where we talked about education. It was like an entire section for that. Like how can we give, like what type of proposals we can give when it comes to um, tackling climate change with uh, education? How can we include in our curriculum? What are your suggestions and proposals? And we were so surprised, we were so surprised because eventually there were amazing proposals from youth on how we can involve that in our curriculum. Uh, how is it already involved in some European countries if 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 maybe uh, people here don't know? So it is already involved. They they included um, climate change as, as a course in, in so many universities uh, in my university that I'm, that I'm now in. So, Indeed, it's not so detailed, but like at least it will kind of introduce you to some of the main uh, challenges that we can actually give, like kind of contribute with some practices and actions to kind of end them, maybe limit them. <laughs> now it's too late to end things. Um, now, basically, the start was with with this summit. Uh, may people, some people be like, you guys are doing gatherings all the time. What's the point of that? It's only about drafting and talking and we're not seeing enough on the ground. So now, the best part is that, yes, all of these proposals and manifestos that we created eventually, they had a great impact after. And actually, so many got involved as well. Uh, we see like the UN promoting for them. We see uh, people taking a proposal to the next level where they implemented it. So when we are seeing amazing here, like we those youth who actually even done that and it was that was the start from a gathering so don't take this gathering seriously especially 
people from my country <laughs> like make sure to take this um uh seriously and, the, and and like we have seen for example in the mina region maybe some regions in africa uh they be like no we're not having access to these conferences we're not having access to these proposals how can we just give and and just go and now like thankfully like in every summit we are having this virtual platforms where we do share like we do contribute a lot to the manifesto itself we do add our proposals we take everything seriously and what we mean by serious is like a proposal that even if it was stated online so that's the best part is that what we want eventually is not the fact of me having a gathering or having fun because it's not fun at, fun at all but it's about me seeing this actually implemented later and again, I insist we have seen already things implemented. Otherwise, we would have never continued in having such gatherings. Now, this is actually the first point that I wanted to address because it was the perfect start that I had and how I showed more interest in that in these two SDGs. Now, after that, I decided to found my own NGO, which is Together for Blue and Green. Uh, thankfully, when I first started, it was um, I, I started it and I had funding, which was from actually one of the European embassies. And, and I decided like to have something special especially in my in my community we're not seeing so many environmental initiatives we don't well to be more precise youth-led initiatives uh, and i wanted to have it all in english because i wanted to continue this drafting not to wait for a certain gathering or a certain conference to bring me and then like start doing things because i wanted to do them in my community with my own people i wanted to introduce them what is even this drafting? What is it even to have a proposal? And, you know, because all of this, I mean, maybe people will wonder, but trust me, in some communities, we don't know this, you know? People don't know that there is proposals and they do exist, policies and you being part of decision-making, we do have the right for this. And some people don't know even this. So kind of introducing them to, to this, and it, which is part of the, it's, it's part of the education I would say the educating system or circle uh it's it's all part of that is like you introducing them to new things that they don't know that they have the right to uh to to get more involved in so it's st i started with the, i founded my ngo and we had like a series i just started to have a series of workshops because it was in covid and um and and these workshops where we brought activists from different um different parts of the world and we had even like business green business owners like eco-friendly businesses where they introduced them to what is it like to have a green business or an eco-friendly business does it even make profits which is actually questions that were raised in, in, in these workshops, because again, people don't know that they can actually have a green business, an eco-friendly business, but still make profits, you know? So um, so we had the opportunity to arrange that. And after that, we decided to kind of take it to the next level where we reach uh, universities. And that's actually what we did. It was the next step. We went to one of the universities who hosted us and we had like a, a student climate youth event, uh, a student climate call event, sorry. So that was actually the main event and we um we even asked professors it was all in english and we asked professors uh to um to kind of who are in the field of of climate change and water sanitation and so on and we um we talked about we had a we had a debate on one of the documentaries which is also like uh one of the things that we wanted to address because it was a climate justice movement and then we had a workshop about a climate justice as a movement what is it exactly and how people can get more involved in this especially the advocacy and the third thing was having this panelist, these professors as panelists, and I remember one of the professors uh, was actually part of COPE, uh, COPE 15, and we had the chance to introduce them to what is COPE, how they can get involved, uh, what are the practices that we need to embrace as youth, uh, what are the actions that we can take, what is it like to be even engaged in fighting for these global concerns. So it was like really perfect to finally address all of this. And the best part is that we had amazing outcomes eventually. People asked for more details. They wanted to get more involved. And, and it was eventually like a very like um, an event that changed mindsets and, and left an impact for, for these people who didn't know much. So basically, that was actually the journey that I had. And it's not only a journey because I'm trying to address things in this and in, in while I would say reciting my story, because it's more um, what I'm trying to say is that I'm urging everyone to try to know, make sure to educate others, simplify things, because that's how it starts. And, and it's fine to start it that way. And we can take it to the next level after that. Uh, thank you so much again for the uh, invitation. Appreciate it. Amazing. Thank you, Salma, for reiterating how important education, especially climate education for a sustainable future, and also for speaking about 
how we must find our local challenges and address them with local solutions, keep respecting the culture of the nation so that we can actually ensure that climate justice. Thank you once again. And I now invite our next speaker, Nozinle Evelyn Gumede, Global Youth Leader, Earth Uprising International. You have the floor. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, it's been good listening to everybody, the panelists. It's been wonderful. So yes, uh, the livelihoods uh, for most uh, the li the livelihoods most impacted by climate change depend on natural resources. Natural resources such as land and water. In Southern Africa, particularly Zimbabwe, most people depend on farming as a source of livelihood. But due to climate change, um, the high temperatures and the low rainfall, the yields are very low. So climate education is important in ensuring human security so that people have food and you know, can afford to take care of their basic needs. As students and youths, we can educate people about climate change and how it affects us. We should also go to those affected so that we have firsthand knowledge. Sometimes we may think that we know everything, but when we go back to the grassroots and actually try and understand what's going on, they might tell us something that we do not know. So I feel like it's very good to bridge the gap between uh, those that are coming from the most impacted areas and those that can actually help them so that you can sit down and actually find a solution together. And uh, I have been working with a local local organization called Green Hut. Uh, we usually do that as well. And we also educate children in schools. Uh, we should start them young so that they grow up with the education they need. Um, unfortunately, in Zimbabwe, it hasn't been the norm that um, uh, climate education was taught in, in primary school. Um, I don't know what it's called, elementary. Yeah, I hope that's correct. It wasn't taught in high school, and it's just been a topic for university. But then we should bridge that gap. We should talk to the children, 10-year-olds. They should know what climate change is, but then the terms need to be simplified. And for those that can't actually speak English, because um, in Southern Africa, some people might not even know English, so that we need to translate it to them and use our local languages like Ndevele, Shona, um, such languages so that people can actually understand what climate change is. If we talk to them in their own language, they'll know what it is and it would be easier to talk to them. So um, yes, we can educate people uh, via social media, but we should also educate them in person. A lot of people don't know what climate change is, and they'll be so confused when you're talking about COP27, they don't know what that is. But if we actually go to the people and sit down with them and talk to them, have meetings in person, because some people don't have the, the uh, internet access, they're not, they do not have the access to internet. So it's best to go to the, um, to go to people, local communities, rural communities, and educate them, not just people that are learned or in schools. So those children that are coming from local communities, rural communities, they also need to be educated. They need to know what's going on because those children are very innovative if given the chance. Um, education is the education is power, and people should be climate education. It, People know what they're dealing with, they'll know the solutions. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Nazinle. And it's you're right, it's absolutely critical to ensure that climate action, climate justice is driven from the bottom up to ensure that our most affected communities are not left behind. And when you said that uh, children in the rural communities are so innovative and given the opportunity. Uh, we worked with a community of ch HIV positive children in Nepal who hadn't had access to education. But when we started working with them, they came up with the most amazing ideas on how to just eradicate plastic in their uh, neighborhood and work towards climate justice there. So that is very, very true. And it's important that everyone works uh, to realize that. And with that, I would like to thank all of our panelists 
uh, who have spoken today about the importance of climate education for human security. And as all of our panelists have reiterated, a very timely and important topic. And as a human society, we unfortunately have still have a very warped sense of what human security means, where states and people even would rather spend trillions to build weapons of mass destruction and in particular for nine states build nuclear weapons that form a facade of human security instead of actually spending that money on what really matters, which is healthcare, education, and addressing climate change, which does form the most existential crisis of our times. So today's panel does prove the importance of climate education, where we need that knowledge and that awareness to educate people about what climate change is, what their local challenges are, and how we must localize uh, those challenges and solutions in order to have true meaningful climate action. If we are to achieve any sort of human security, we have to work towards addressing climate change and vice versa so that we can truly create a just and equitable world where everyone has a life of dignity, where no one is left behind, and where we're actually able to sustain our human race. So thank you very much for being with us here today. This has been a wonderful discussion, and we wish you all the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. And together, let us join hands and go out there and work towards climate action. Thank you very much. And goodbye.